We're going to start this presentation today out with a 16-minute DVD that is, was produced by the Minnesota Association of Townships. And it will give you a brief idea of, uh, of township government. And when it's over with, uh, I'll talk about sp some specific differences between cities, townships, and the way they're governed and a little bit of history on, on how, town, how and why townships were formed and some dates and some different things. So, with that said, we'll start the DVD presentation. The chances are you have a pretty good idea of what government is, but maybe you don't know about the principal building block of democracy. Let's go back to square one. North America is served by four levels of government. Of course, there is the federal government in Washington. Beyond that, unless you live in the District of Columbia, you live in one of 50 states. In Minnesota, we have 87 counties. Even most tribal governments, which are sovereign nations, are located within counties. In Minnesota, there are basically two forms of local government. Township government is true grassroots democracy, where the residents vote directly on the issues that concern them. Each year on Township Day, the second Tuesday in March, most townships throughout the state hold their elections and the annual meeting where residents decide the tax levy for the year and other pressing issues. Those are some of the similarities of townships in Minnesota. In this presentation, we will explore some of the differences, as well as the history of township government and the role that it plays in our lives, whether or not we live in a township. When and how were the first townships formed? Brandon. The first townships were formed by a federal law passed in 1787 called the Northwest Ordinance. Good answer, Brenda. The original townships were divided by invisible lines into square sections. What were the dimensions of these sections? The original square townships, as mandated by the 1785 land ordinance, were 6 miles by 6 miles, or 36 square miles. Many townships are still that size. After gaining independence from the British, the early Americans began to look beyond the boundaries of the original 13 colonies. What they perceived was a huge, mostly unexplored, undefined continent that would be available for development. Even before the Constitution was written and the Republic officially began, the Continental Congress passed the Land Ordinance of 1785 and the Northwest Ordinance in 1787 that defined the process for development of a huge area northwest of the Ohio River. It laid out a very orderly process of surveying the land to 36 square mile townships. The form of township government was borrowed from England, but the 36 square mile squares were an American innovation, probably thought out by surveyors like George Washington, who trained himself in surveying technique at age 15, became an assistant at age 16 on a surveying trip through Virginia, and became, at age 17, the official surveyor for Culpeper County in Virginia. Another of the founding fathers who influenced the Northwest Ordinance was Thomas Jefferson, the son of a surveyor and a surveyor in his own right. The process that started almost four years before writing the Constitution is still in play today in Minnesota. Incidentally, another president was also a professional surveyor for a while. At age 24, Abe Lincoln worked for a few years as the deputy county surveyor in Sangamon County in Illinois. When Minnesota became a territory in 1849, the mapping into 36 mile squares moved forward very rapidly. By 1859, the survey was largely completed, and the tri-state marker at the Minnesota, Iowa, and South Dakota border was put in place by the U.S. Geodesic Survey. There are three positions to be held in each township. Who can name the three positions? Sarah. Supervisors, a treasurer, and a clerk. Good. A load of logs going to the mill in northern Minnesota. A grain truck in western Minnesota. A 
load of sugar beets in Crookston. A truck in central Minnesota picking up the raw milk that may end up on your breakfast cereal. The products of rural Minnesota that fuel our economy very often begin the journey on township roads. There are 59,000 miles of township roads in Minnesota and 6,000 bridges. The nearly 1,800 townships in the state are responsible for the maintenance of these roads and bridges. It's only one of the duties of townships, but a very important one. These same township roads often lead to recreational areas of the state. Wabido Township in Cass County, for example, has many residents who live on lakefront property. Along the north shore of Lake Superior, Lutzen Township is a long way from the nearest city and has its own volunteer fire department and first responder capability. In the Red River Valley on the other side of the state, St. Vincent Township is the most northwest government in Minnesota. Throughout the state, there are original town halls dating all the way back to 1864 in the case of St. Lawrence Township, or even older. These halls are still in use today. Other townships are building new town halls that provide for energy efficiency and low maintenance. The differences from township to township can be significant depending upon the local situation. Is the township totally rural? Is it on the edge of an urban area? Does it have a lot of seasonal visitors? Perhaps the most significant difference between townships is the number of residents. The range is from as few as 25 or 30, all the way up to White Bear Township, north of St. Paul. With almost 12,000 residents, it has the largest population of any township in Minnesota. It is also the oldest township in the state, dating back to 1858 and is the only township left in Ramsey County. It may also be the smallest township in the state. Its original 36 square miles has been reduced by three quarters to slightly more than nine square miles because of annexation by all the surrounding cities. White Bear Township has about 17 employees and takes care of most of its own services, but smaller townships may lack the resources to provide for all the responsibilities and may make arrangements with other governments, such as local cities, other townships, or the county, to provide needed services to the township for a negotiated fee or contribution of some sort. These arrangements are called joint powers agreements or service contracts that are very common, especially for fire protection and other public safety services. This process of sharing responsibilities with other governmental units is being explored by townships all over the state as a way of improving efficiency and quality of services. As you drive down practically any highway in Minnesota, sooner or later you will see a town hall of one of the nearly 1,800 townships that represent local grassroots government for nearly one quarter of the population of the state. We're in Randall, right in the middle of the state, on an early evening in late September. A large group of people from all around the surrounding area have gathered for a meeting. Dinner comes first, then the meeting. These people are all elected government officials of townships, representatives of the more than 9,000 township officers in the state. They have their own organization, the Minnesota Association of Townships. This is the annual meeting of the 8th District. The association has 13 districts, and the elected director of each district constitutes the board of directors of the association. Barbara Welty is the director in District 8. I want to thank all of you for having the opportunity to represent you the last three years on the Minnesota Association of Township Board. The election of a director to represent the district for the upcoming year is one item on the agenda. There are also guest speakers who present information on issues affecting townships. In this case, the issue was pandemics, such as avian flu, and what a township must do to respond to such a situation. It is an opportunity to hear from the federal and state elected officials that represent the area. And it's a hot issue. I'm also a township resident, grew up in one. I appreciate the work that David and Kent and Barb do for us down the state. They kind of keep us in line for you. The meeting is also an occasion for the executive director of the township association to address the members. Just this year alone, 
There's about 37 bills that have affected the townships. Uh, Jim and Rob and I and Kent uh, really did most of the legislative work, and I think we had a very successful year. But with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Kent. Thank you. Township officers are encouraged to be a part of the legislative process that takes place in St. Paul and Washington. These meetings are opportunities for the township officers to help set the priorities for legislative action. Matt keeps the officers informed through the bi-monthly newspaper, the Minnesota Township News. It also presents more than 40 days per year of extensive training in all facets of township responsibility. Minnesota Association of Townships also created and manages a joint powers insurance trust that provides a full range of insurance coverage and risk management services to its member townships. The activities of MAT culminate in the annual meeting which occurs in late November. The nearly 1,800 townships in Minnesota are as diverse as the state itself. Here are some of the stories that are currently part of township life today. It's easier to start at the township level and grow into it than it is to have the state come in and say, this is what you folks have to do. And we're trying to be proactive and get a jump start on that. Next up, we've got uh, Gary from TCPA. Gary has a request for meets and miles. So we still need the legislature to come through and put a, a level playing field for us all out there and keep in mind that the township cities and property owners have to work together and work out what's the best interest for the community and we all want to be good neighbors in this thing. Realize that the Pike Bay Police Department isn't here to supplant any other police departments here to supplement them. And so consequently, we work hand in hand with not only the tribal police, but the county sheriff and the highway patrol, and anybody else in the area that uh, is in law enforcement. We work, we work together just like that. The effective communication is what it's based on. The effective uh, communication, honest communication, and the willingness to sit down and recognize that collaboration and networking takes some energy as well, and a, and a time commitment. We may be living in what we call a township, so Bemidji County or Northern Township, maybe we're, we're in the city of Bemidji, but we realize that we are all one community. We're just trying to restore the process so that township voice can be heard and that the cities and townships are an equal playing field. The people that are doing township work, I think, are really dedicated to their work and they want to see township survive. Township government is the closest to the people. These things are changing at such a rapid rate. It's so hard to stay on top of the laws that are being modified, uh, being rewritten, being redone. I think the thing that's important for me is that even as the laws are changing, we're aware of the fact that the laws are changing, but we got to maintain that balance between who we are and what we are in the local community and still try and implement the things that the legislature is directing us to do. For us township officers, we get in depth on questions that um, we don't get to at other trainings. I think that Matt puts on some of the best trainings for township officers. I'm finding out that township officers have better training than uh, do other governmental units. Through the years, I've noticed that there have been more women, but I've also noticed that there have been younger people coming into it, and that's really exciting to me because it's uh, good to know that they are willing to pick up the concept of this grassroots government and keep it going, and it's really refreshing. <laughs> is so special because it gives power directly to the people. They vote on their own issues.
was a, somewhat of a political um, overview from the Minnesota Association of Townships on, I guess, basically on what townships are all about. Um, I was surprised that there are 1,788 townships in the state of Minnesota when I saw this video the first time. And this video dates to 2007, by the way. Um, and it's, but it was a, the only and the best thing I could find as a brief overview, at least, uh, for, for what townships are all about. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the local area here. Um, Newport Township was organized in 1858, the same year that Minnesota became a state. And it in, included in its original <coughs> boundaries what, to, what used to be called Red Rock, Newport, St. Paul Park, and Gray Cloud. In 1887, St. Paul Park, uh, excuse me, when St. Paul Park was platted in 1887, Newport Township was divided into two parts. With Newport and Red Rock to the north and Great Cloud Island to the south. In 1889, the village of Newport, including the former Red Rock settlement, were incorporated. Greycott Island Township was originally part of Newport Township, and Newport Township consisted of the cities of Newport, St. Paul Park, and the western half of Greycott Island. In 1889, the city of Newport incorporated, and in 1909, the city of St. Paul Park incorporated. In 1958, the remainder of Newport Township changed its name to Great Cloud Island Township in order to avoid confusion with the city of Newport. So that's how Great Cloud Island Township became a township of its own, as an example. Uh, original townships were formed to allow man man land management and to allow people to have a method to be able to say, I own this property. Before, before the original townships were laid out, people just squatted, and they couldn't prove they owned the land. But once they were platted, then they could get a property description. And, and, but then that's the basis originally for, the, in, for townships to be initiated. Um, There are six townships in Washington County alone, uh, and they are uh, um, let's see, I would I uh, Baytown, Denmark Township, Great Cloud Island, May Township, Stillwater Township, and West Lakeland Township, and the uh, the differences between townships and city government are somewhat, well, they can be radically different and they're, they're, they're so basically similar in a lot of ways. Um, cities have two elected officials, and they are the mayor and the council members. And council members can be elected in, in cities now. Council members can be elected by precinct, or by or at large, and that depends on the status of the city and how big they are, what the population is. I don't know the exact formula, but as an example, both Newport and St. Paul Park elect their officials, at, their council members at large. And townships have three elected officials, and they are township supervisors, a clerk, and a treasurer. The big, one of the biggest differences between townships and cities is the people in townships get to vote on their tax levies, they get to vote on 
how much money people spend, how much the township spends on roads, and there are three different categories in 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 uh, township government, and they are a general purpose category. Now these are things that the people actually vote on in the annual meeting, which is held on the second Tuesday of March every year. Next week, as a matter of fact. There's there's a there's a uh, a general purpose of, of funding and levy uh, column, and that includes all the things you would normally think of: payroll, insurance, publishing, news, uh, you know, uh, printer paper, you know. Uh, um, building maintenance, administration, legal, um, and all those things that, that, that go into general purpose funding. Now, at the annual meeting next Tuesday, I get the honor, I guess, of presenting this to the, to the residents of the township, and there, there is a dollar amount associated with that general purpose fund, and the people get to vote on it. That's the first vote they make. The second vote is for public safety. That's the, the second of the three categories. Public safety is, is uh, fire, police, ambulance, um, and uh, animal control and all those related things. And that is a, a second category, and the people that vote on that particular issue also. And then there's public works, which is commonly referred to as road and bridge. That's the third topic that people vote on. And that includes all the normal things you might think of. Grading, seal coating, painting the roads, repairing them, uh, snow plowing, and, and, and uh, uh, actually sewage disposal is listed on here too, even though you know everybody in the township does have a septic system. And the, that, that, all three of these are presented by the chair of the town board at the annual meeting, and they're voted on independently. And at the end of that vote, then there is the culmination of all of those three that make the total tax levy for the coming year. And if the people also vote on that. So that's the four things that the people vote on at the annual meeting in a township. If they think the town board is out of control and they're over levying or the tax rate's going to be 6% higher or 10% or whatever it ends up being, they can vote to change that. And it's a, it's a completely different concept, uh, you know, for people that live in a city to be able to think that they could go to their annual meeting and if they had enough support, they can change the dollar amounts in these three things if they don't like them. And they, they make a motion, second it, just like a normal B, and they vote on it. So uh, that, I guess, would be the nuts and bolts of the biggest difference between cities and townships. Um, the, uh, let's see, I got a couple other notes here. Three elected officials, I already covered that. And, oh, cities have a mayor elect, and townships do not elect a chair of the town board. It's not an elected position. All, in Greg Hogg's case, there are three township supervisors, and, and bigger townships can have any multiple of supervisors they want, as long as it's an odd number. So there can be three, five, seven, nine, uh, whatever, whatever they like or want or feel is necessary. And smaller townships like Greg Hogg, as an example, um, three supervisors are certainly enough. And the January meeting of every year, the three supervisors decide who is going to be the chair of the town board for the year. So it's not an elected position, it's a position that's, that's the three people agree on uh, for to be the chair. Um, so, uh, let's see. Okay, and that's pretty much it, you know, in terms of the, the real, real differences between cities and townships. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Uh, 
Yeah. How long have you been in the chair? How long have I been in the chair? For Gray Cloud Island Town. I've been I've been a member of the town board for since 2000, okay. the year 2000. Um, I've been the chair. I don't know. You know me. Last 10 years, at least. I'm retired. You know, so when you're retired, you get to be the chair. <laughs> because that means that you get to go to all the day meetings that happen that somebody from the township should go to. Sorry, it's not 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 much more glamorous than that. <laughs> what, what what is your role as chair? What do you do? The role as the township chair is is to uh, conduct the meetings. You know, and, uh, the the role of the of the city mayor is to conduct the meetings. And the same thing is true of the township. The town, bear, town chair simply runs the, the monthly meetings or any meeting that has to be called, any special meeting that might have to be called. Kirby. Dick, do you guys usually try to levy on the side of having a surplus, you know, like you I, I, plugs? I'm sorry, Kirby. Okay, do you try to levy on the side of a surplus to anticipate things like floods or? Oh, okay, yeah. You know, Okay, thanks. Townships sort of have a unique spot in life in terms of, of how how they how they can carry surpluses and how they can carry um, well surplus bank accounts and things. You know, uh, townships don't levy like most municipalities, city city or, or county municipalities do. For as example, road repairs. We don't we don't levy individual property owners for improvements. The the uh, the way that that's handled is by the as an example the road and bridge levy every year. You you simply over levy for what you know you're going to spend and you save that money. And then when it's time to fix a road, you have the money and you pay for it at large. So landowners within the township all share an equal cost, if you will, for any road improvement rather than just the ones that are on the live on that block or whatever you want, however you'd like to call it. So that that's a major difference also between it, I don't know, does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Yes. I heard a lot of talk about your meetings. I heard a lot of talk about your meetings, and some of them were really contentious. Do you still have that problem? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's another. Uh, okay, thank you all for being the street people for me. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, township meetings are, are are really quite informal <laughs> compared to you know city meetings. And people people tend to speak up, you know, and, and uh, there there can be some very serious uh, disagreements <laughs> that that actually become public if you watch some meetings on TV. You know, you obviously uh, you could know that. Um, there there are we're a small township, and I'll talk specifically about Great Club. We're we're a small township, and we only have. I'll give me 300 and some odd members, or, or citizens. I mean, you know, not you know, members. Okay, whatever. The the uh, the main that we have one major industry, and that's aggregate industries, and they operate their their limestone quarry. And there are people that are are uh, anti mining, as an example. Um, and there are there are people that are uh, the truth is there are people that are anti and a Department of, of Natural Resources also. Uh, we live in the Mississippi critical area, and uh, the, the, uh, the rules that we have to, to live by are different than other townships too because of that. And so there, there could be some heated arguments, and sometimes it's, it's, it's because people don't understand that we're living under some different rules uh, also. Um, we, we, and all townships in, in the in the Washington County, uh, as of uh, two years ago, were were given full land use authorization from the county 
The county backed out of it. Out of the, we used to be the county used to be responsible for what our land use. They would set our our, our zoning rules. You know, they would do everything, and and we had to adhere to that. Uh, that was that was given back to all Washington County townships as of the first of the year, two years ago, and so now. We hold our own variance hearings, as an example. Uh, we do our own zoning. If we don't like the lot sizes that the county imposed on us, we can change them. You know, we couldn't do that before. So we really ended up now being a really independent uh, entity within the, the regulations that uh, citizens are, are, are required to adhere to. We haven't changed anything yet. Uh, from the old county standards, personally, Breakout has, and some of the other townships have. But we're subjected to the new rules from the Mississippi Critical Area that we that no one has, has implemented yet, and we need to wait until those are finalized before we can decide whether we want to change our minimum lot sizes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we got a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, Dick, are you? Uh controlled by the Metropolitan, uh, Metro, uh, Metropolitan Council? Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, townships haven't escaped the Met Council. Uh, we have to do a 20-year a, 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 a comprehensive plan just like everybody else does uh, that the Met Council has to approve. And it's always a struggle. And, uh, they, uh, but it, it always happens. We, we, we're pretty proud of ourselves. We just had to, everyone just went through the, the latest update. And we were one of the very first Met Council approvals of our, of our 2040 comprehensive plan. So I think we were either second or third of all the Met Council area that got their, their uh, comprehensive plan approved. So, Brett. How does the city of Cottage Grove fit into that uh, town township program? How does it fit? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, Fred, but the simple truth is they're, they're not part of any township. That's what I wanted to know. Well, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, they're, they annexed land away from Greycott Island Township back in the 80s, but that became city land at that time. Not it had nothing to do with townships. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Other than the loss of land you know, to the to the township. Yeah. Cottage Grove was a township, but I don't know how long they were a township before they changed over to the city. I didn't do any research on Cottage Grove for this yeah. for this talk. I I thought that all townships were six square miles. Mm -hmm. And like that presentation said, uh, near as I can tell, Newport Township was never six square miles. Mm -hmm. And because they were, I don't know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. And the only thing that I came up with is, I think they ran out of, they did it by county. And they ran out of land when they got to the Mississippi River because it's a different county. And so they went, um, what I was able to find out is they started platting from our example in Washington County is Point Douglas. They started at the southeast corner of the county and went to the northeast corner of the county when they laid out the six square mile townships. And they must have run out of land when they got to the Mississippi River. Because Newport Township is, is just, the original township is just long, you know, started, and it wasn't even actually, Red Rock was kind of an independent thing for a while. It, it's unclear, I couldn't get the full dates or anything, but it, it merged with Newport Township, and then Newport Township moved all the way to the Ramsey County border at that time. So, this all happened in the 1800s, and there's... It's a little foggy, but um, we, as far as I can tell, Newport Township never was six square miles. It's it's six miles long, but it's fairly narrow. So, okay. I have a little history on Great Cloud. I know there's a lot of history down there. 
uh, we had a doctor, I'm from Old Cottage Grove, and we had a doctor in our town by the name of Dr. Steen. And he took care of the Indians down there. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, an interesting story I read about him was the Indians later on were wondering where he actually lived. So a bunch of them come out to Old Cottage Grove, and they were peeking in all the windows <laughs> houses. <laughs> and the people were absolutely frightened because these Indians were looking in all the windows. And I, he was a great guy, and he just took care of these people, and they loved him. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. But he lived in Cottage Grove. Yes. In, yeah. in old, what we call, all call old, old Cottage, Cottage Grove. Grove. That's right. Yeah, yes. okay. Yes. That's, 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 that's good. <laughs> all right. Okay, Any, anything else? Yes. I was just, I want to be clear on the supervisors and the treasurer. Are they elected uh, positions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, supervisors are elected at large within the township. Okay. And that, that, that is every township. And the treasurer is elected separately, and the clerk is elected separately. And in Great Cloud, we serve four-year terms. Okay. When, and we are, we are considered a, Great Cloud is considered a municipal township. And we have slightly varying rules from rural townships, the state legislative body, and, and I don't know the date, declared any township that was within a certain distance from the state capital, and that number has varied from different things that I've read, could, could, if they so desired, become a municipal township, which put the township's election cycle on the federal cycle. Rural townships all elect their supervisors, treasurers, and clerks on the second Tuesday of March at their annual meeting. Their, those, their, their elections and the municipal townships didn't have to become that. That was their choice. And if they didn't, they still elect all their supervisors and treasurers on March, in this year it's March 12th. Um, Fred. Who are the officers of the Great Cloud Township? Who are they? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm one of the supervisors. And Paul Schoenecker is, is a supervisor. And Raymond... Um, <laughs> come on, <Dick. laughs> Ray Kaiser is the third supervisor. Paul works for the University of Minnesota in the building inspection department. Ray Kaiser is a is a uh, engineer at Delta Airlines, and our treasurer is uh, is Scott Leak, and he, he is a financial guy uh, that works you know works full time, uh, and our clerk is uh, Cheryl McCulty, and she was just elected uh, this past year. There are two supervisors, because there's three of us, there are two of us up for election every presidential cycle, and one of them is up for election like last year on the, uh, uh, the two-year cycle. Both the treasurer and, and the two supervisors are on the four-year cycle, and the clerk and the odd supervisor is on the, is, is on the midterm election cycle. Uh, but th those, those are the people that serve on Great Club. Yes? I'm assuming that Great Cloud Township got its name from perhaps an Indian Maybe chief. Maybe I better come closer. <laughs> I was assuming that Great Cloud Township got its name from an Indian chief called Great Cloud. Okay, no, no, it didn't. <laughs> that, that's, that's a real popular misconception. Okay. Great Cloud Woman was the person that the township is named after. And there's, there's all, you know, I, I think, I don't know if there's some great, there's some great cloud stuff here. This wasn't intended to necessarily be a great cloud presentation, but because, because I'm from great cloud, it makes some sense you know, to do it that way. But yes, great cloud woman, and she, her, uh, help me out, Naomi, her, her grand, granddaughter 
was it that just died here about three years ago? Or was it her daughter? No, that goes back to the 1800s. No, the one that was in the, the woman that was in the, uh, what, the, the reservation over on, and, and uh, over by Shakopee, uh, that was related to her. Uh, okay, never mind that. But, no, it, she was, she was an Indian woman that the township, or, or that the name Grey Cloud originally, one of the township then, the yeah, name Grey Cloud. There were two Grey Cloud women, the mother and the daughter. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the er er errors to that name just died within the last couple, three years. Uh, probably five years ago, actually. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, that's a popular deal. There's a lot of people think it was an Indian chief, and it was not. So, you know, I'm not going to get into the Indian, Indian, the way they did business, but the women kind of ran the tribes, no matter what people thought. <laughs> so, uh, you, know. <laughs> you, read, you read a lot of Minnesota history about the uprising and things, and past Indian chiefs' wives were all spared and everything from all these murders and things that took place, and there's a reason for that. So, uh, so, yeah. Anyway, any, any other questions? Yes? Did the township have any responsibility with last year's opening of the Great Cloud Channel? And then, uh, was that DNR? Or, and then with Settlers Island, I've heard that's going to be uh, developed into some parkland. Does the township have any say or responsibility in these things happening? Does, I really like that the channel was open. It's great for kayaking. <laughs> well, to answer your first question, the township was involved in the year 2000 on trying to get that backwater opened, and it was a township supervisor at the time that started that whole project. It took that long? Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, it took that long. Yep. And a number of us uh, were, were at the Capitol test, you know, testifying uh, for the project. <clears throat> The project ended up being a Washington County Watershed Conservation District project. That's how it ended up happening. For the back channel was simply dying, and it was it would become a swamp. And it was a it was a restoration project from the watershed district to restore the natural habitat. And funding funding for the project came from the watershed district. They got you know, federal grant money. And it came from lottery also from the state. The state paid, you know, when you buy a, a Powerball ticket, a certain amount of that money goes to the state fund <coughs> that supports these things. And that was a, that started out to be, it would, that project started out with the original township supervisor. He contacted uh, the engineering department at the University of Minnesota, and they designed a, a, a big culvert for that project. Uh, and it, it went nowhere, and, and, and it wouldn't have, as it turns out. But it was a wonderful start <clears throat> to the project. It was just a square foot long tunnel that, to allow water to go through, and that, that sort of thing presents enormous problems. You know, people get stuck in there, they try to canoe through it, uh, all sorts of things that, that caused that not to happen. But it got the ball rolling, is what happened. And the, uh, the yes, to answer your question, the township had a lot to do with that. So, Good work. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then you'll have uh, jurisdiction over Settlers Island if that's ever developed in the park. Settlers land. Island is a multiple vicinity, multiple regulatory island. Part of that island is in Great Cloud Township, and part of it is in Cottage Grove. And that that may or may not present a problem when the time comes because the part that's in the township is privately owned. So. And uh, the uh, and Cottage Grove knows that, you know. So the uh, it, and it's a floodplain island, and so you know, I don't know. 
you know, news at news at midnight. You know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You Is know. there a sign up yet? Is there a sign? There's supposed to be a sign to tell all about it. Do you know if it's up yet? I have not okay. seen any it's sign. To be the last time I went by that island, it's supposed was to be on a tree or something. Maybe they'll do it in the summer. But there I went by that. The last time I went by that okay. island was last fall okay. when there was nothing there. But there was supposed to be something uh, telling all about it. Could be. Uh, the, the city. The city was informed by the township when they bragged about all this that they were going to, they were probably going to be asked to fence off to private park and stuff. And I think you know they kind of backed off. So I don't know where that stands. So, yes. Does Great Cloud Island have its own fire department? Great Cloud Island purchases like the 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 the, the DVD showed. We do not have any municipal services. We buy all those municipal services from adjoining cities. We buy our fire and police protection on an annual contract from the city of St. Paul Park, as an example. Um, you know, we have 300 people, five, 